Yeah, thanks so much. Um, yeah, containerizing distributed pipes. Um, I'm Hagen, you can find me on LinkedIn. Um, I work for Sony. Um, we put PlayStation chips in racks and then we give you a streaming service where you can basically subscribe to PlayStation games and stream it to your device. And so we have quite a fleet of computers. Um, what I'm showing here though is just a proof of concept that's not actually related to what we do in production, but it's kind of a research thingy that is ongoing, see if we can make use of containerizing distributed pipes. And I have to give special thanks to Christian Kniep, that's the Twitter handle there. He supports me a lot with the containerizing part of everything, basically, but um, I'm just stealing his work and just use it. Um, so I give a bit of background. Um, then we talk about a tool chain, which should run distributed. Uh, then we talk a little bit about containerizing, and then we have a recap. So the background, uh, buzzwords first, of course. Um, there was this talk from Martin Kleppmann where he said the Unix philosophy of distributed data, and I got a bit hooked, and I thought, wow, that's kind of a cool idea. Can I actually use it? And by that time, he was doing Samsa, and I was like, oh, no, Samsa, it runs on Yarn, and I need Hadoop and everything, and I was like, oh, not now. Um, and then there were Kafka, and Kafka came up with this uh, Streams API, and I thought, ah, no, I can try it. Now it's every, everything is simple, apparently. So um, I thought, OK, what's a Unix pipe? So a Unix pipe is a process chain where the output of one process is the input of the next. And I guess we all know it, but um, I guess we also lost it a bit in the industry, actually, because programs that do one thing and do one thing well who has written a program lately that does this? <laughs> really? <laughs> Good. <laughs> um, work together. And I, I know working together is kind of like, yeah, yeah, we have an API, we go this, but using an API always couples our code to that API, right? So there are other means, basically, by LNK, where working together means something a bit different, and I think we need to go back and be simpler with everything to make that actually happen. Um, and then it's, here's something controversial. A guy from Copenhagen, BSD developer, said, use text streams because that's a universal interface. And there's a lot of stuff on the internet that says, ah, string-oriented programming, not my thing, use types, and then you're fine. Well, I don't know. The, the guy from the 70s have a lot of wisdom for me, so I just put it out there because I think it's, it's controversial and nice. Um, okay, short recap on Kafka. It's this thing that you put in your infrastructure and then you're good. Because you can now shift around, <laughs> you can shift around tons of data and you don't worry, it just runs perfectly. Um, there are some, some, some problems with that, I guess, uh, but everybody has to figure it out. My operation teams always said we don't have any problems with Kafka and I'm happy about that and I'm, I just believe them and actually we have no production outage of Kafka. It's just, just seems to be good. Um, yeah, but you can, you can shuffle around data in your organization and this is a data hub basically and it's also an append log. It looks something like that. You have a Zookeeper ensemble and you have a bunch of broker and that's like your cluster. Then you have a notion of a topic that's just a queue where you have your messages in. Then Kafka has also this notion of partitioning where the topics get partitioned and that within a partition there's a strictly ordering. So not the topic itself has a, a straight ordering but the partition themselves they have. So here's this, what kind of partition key are you using and what does it mean for your data processing pipeline? But um, anyways, so Kafka will to also replications of your partition, meaning I have one partition, then you can say make it three times and then shift it around in the cluster. It does that for you very nicely, actually. And then it would look like this. You have your broker and then you have your partitions and the copies of your partition. So there's also a notion of uh, data locality. Then, of course, you can produce messages uh, to the topic. You can consume messages from the topic. And then here's the nice thing, you can actually uh, build groups of consumers where you can then read from a topic and then say this one group A, that's your BI team, reading your events if you want, and then group two is your SRE team also reading the events but very differently. But they can do this now without 
running into trouble or have any synchronization between them. They just can do that independently of each other. Um, here, the streaming API, just the, like you, you should go read the docs. That's highly, simplification, uh, highly simplified here. But um, whoever has used Storm in the beginning or other processing uh, libraries knows we have this notion of a topology. How should our data processing pipeline look like? And you have it in a low-level API for Kafka Streams, then you can build custom aggregators, you can build custom processors, which I think it actually looks very similar to what uh, Storm offers you uh, from API-wise. But then you have also a high-level API, and there you have a notion of streams and tables, and you can interchange them, because if you have a stream of changes, then that actually is always a view on a certain table at a given time. Um, the high-level API also comes with something uh, flat map and map and reduce, I guess. And you can have joins, meaning if you convert a stream to a table and another stream also to a table, then you can go join them and then give me the different stream or always look at, at pairs of data from different Kafka topics. Very nice. Um, so the stream table thingy looks a bit like, okay, this is my first change, then the table looks like this. This is my second change, my table looks like this. Third change, table looks like this. So you can interchange them or, yeah, interchange them. Stream processing recap. Um, this is actually, I guess, uh, from, from Martin Kleppmann's talk. Oh, no. It's from some talk from Confluent. I can't remember yet. Um, so in the beginning, there was Apache Storm, and I used it quite a bit. We actually uh, use it at Sony, I guess. Um, then we have Spark and Flink. I know there are up to 10 stream processors now, actually, um, but these are the most important ones. They are quite capable, meaning the APIs are vast, broad, powerful. I don't know if it's actually powerful if they are that big, but um, you can do a lot with that. And then simplicity. I don't know who has, had, has somebody uh, debugged a storm topology in production? Nice experience? <laughs> so yeah, it's, it's not that easy. Um, for Spark, we, we had a talk today, and it's kind of like you need to know the uh, knobs uh, for Flink. I, I've n never been in touch with Flink, actually. I, don't, I hope they learned a lot from the former attempts, and so everything is now simple and easy. Um, and then on that, on these two dimensions, Kafka would go and be very, very simply because if you have a running Kafka anyways, what you do is basically write your stream processor, put it in a jar, and run the jar, and done. You don't need like 10 SREs running your Hadoop infrastructure. Um, so, yeah, you don't. Um, so, coming back to distributed piping, so one can think of a pipe as a Kafka topic or a partition, depending on how you lay out your data. And then the function which processes the output of one pipe. So in this case, the pipe would be the message broker Kafka, and a stream processing job would be, of course, a closure application, because nobody else, like, why would you use any other language? Um, and then you can have, like, this would be like, OK, we, we know this. This is Linux, Unix command line stuff, right? You do, you do kind of this with cat and awk and last and whatever. Um, so this is the goal. Can we build something that looks like this and feels very similar? Um, so to do that, I built uh, some tools, and I call them distributed because I can basically have this one implementation and then start multiple instances of uh, my tool. and. Uh, yeah, there will be Lisp, lots of parentheses. Um, but the good thing is, uh, after half a year of doing that, the parentheses are no longer exist. That's, they just vanish. And then everything is very clear. So I built this cutter. Um, he takes a string, and he comes up with a list of tokens. And with some error handling and some blah, 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 it's basically just one function, right? You split anything at the space. And then for the stream mapper, uh, or the stream builder, it's called, it's the, does that work if I point it here? So you have the stream builder, and then what, oop, wrong button. Um, 
you need to do the serialization and configure it, and then you say, ah, this is my input topic, then you can do some processing. I mentioned that flat map, map. And then at the end, you put it out, and you can change serialization here if you want, but because everything is string uh, in Denmark, um, we can, this is also just string. And then you start your stream, and that's about it. And uh, I think it's, in Java it would be look a little bit different. I guess in Scala it would be way tighter and way better and faster, of course, but um, I, I prefer this. Um, then I have built a heavy hitter, um, which is, um, he takes in this list of tokens and he estimates their frequencies. That's uh, what a heavy hitter does. And it uses account min sketch data structure where you, uh, where you have your item and you have a bunch of hash functions and a table size basically and then you go and hash that item through all hash functions and place them at the given position in your table and when you retrieve them you get all your values back and then choose the minimum and magically there's some math behind it it's actually a good estimate of the frequency of that token um, and then for having a heavy hitter you just go and take Tom and every X window time if you want and then you have at 20 p.m. That was my five uh, heavy hitters um, And that looks something like this. So here I'm using the uh, low-level API Because I need to add a processor and I cheated a bit because there's this tiny function where I said get processor just does that um, and uh, Here's something very cool, which is also in Samsa. You can have a state store. So every time your processor is doing and handling state, in this case, my uh, data structure uh, for the heavy hitter, it goes, yeah, 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 taking in, taking in, taking in, and now zunk. And then it spits out that state onto another topic in Kafka, and my other processors will actually share that state. And so it's the bad mutual shared state, but I guess if you do it in Kafka, it's completely fine and you don't need to worry about it. Um, and then, yeah, you just, uh, I guess it's on the next slide. Um, here's the processor. So you have this init function, it's, it's, it's very Java-ish, right? You have to implement something here, the processor, of course, you have to do that. And then you have your init function, that's this one here. And then I set up my, uh, have you hit a data structure and my min sketch thingy? Then I process every value that's coming through, actually, key value pair, sketch, put to heavy hitter, and on punctuate, I go and flush the data structure onto the stream. Uh, so back into another topic. And uh, if the system closes down, I can gracefully shut down. I forgot I made this. Uh, then, at the end, I need to aggregate my results, right? So because I have a distributed system, I come back and have these Alvis uh, token eight times estimated and ten times estimated, and uh, that's not going to work, so I need to actually group by key and then count. So I need this refi aggregator. I need to do my custom aggregator here, because obviously you cannot just simply add I don't know if there are actually high-level APIs that don't require you to implement an add function. Um, but it's the same thing. You build your stream, you aggregate by key, whatever you would like to do. You need an initializer and an aggregator here for that. Serialization again, and then you put it into a stream, then you map it back again. I want to create a JSON here, and uh, then I put it out again. So it looks very similar like the first one. It's there's not much to it, actually. It's just the API. And at the end, I sync everything to Elasticsearch. So I have this estimated aggregated values, 10 plus 8. And then I come up with this JSON structure. And then uh, to make more propaganda about closure, we steal this Go thingy from a paper, said the author. But I guess he just was envy of Golang. So I guess it's, that's the real reason. We have Go loops, which is awesome. You just consume from a Kafka topic, get your JSONs, and uh, build an ES connection, and then just index it. That's trivial. Um, so it's almost keep it stupid simple. 
It's not because it's still GVM stuff and there are a billion lines of code underneath you, but from the top it looks simple, I think. Um, so recap, we have the string, we have the list of tokens, we have the estimated values, and then we have the aggregated values, and then we end up with a JSON and Elasticsearch. Okay, so that was the tooling, the pipe. Now, how do we put this in containers? And we had to fiddle around with that a lot, so meaning we, Christian and me, um, because we had two attempts, basically. And when I get to know Christian, he was always using console for service discovery, and I was like, ah, it's so complicated. Why do we need another system to do that? I don't <laughs> Yeah, but so the first, uh, we will get to that. So we basically tried two things, how to containerize, and, and we come to that in a minute. But first of all, recap. Operating system level virtualization, multiple isolated user spaces. I know there's some controversy about what actually means isolated user space because if I am root in a container, I will be root on the host and that's evil. Anyway, it's evil to be root. It has nothing to do with a container or Docker. It shouldn't be root. You shouldn't run as root. Um, so in the old school days, because yesterday I had a nice conversation, I was basically, yeah, we have this container and the client wants us to put Windows XP in a container. So the container is some couple of tens of gigabytes big, and it's kind of something has gone wrong here, but nobody notices it. Um, so the old school was basically, yeah, that's virtualization. You have your server, you have your host kernel, then you have the host's user land where you do all your magic sysadmin stuff, and then you use the hypervisor, and maybe you've got an Intel chip, and then your hypervisor is also in hardware and very efficient. Um, and then you got the uh, host kernels and the user land and the servers on top. So this is VM virtualization. And uh, yeah, with Docker or containers, we don't need it anymore because uh, it looks like this. We have a host kernel and we have the server and then we still have the user land of the host and maybe we have a service there like log collection or metric collection or something. But then we can have all our containers with their own user land and their service implementation and yeah, it's a bit simpler, and uh, we all love simplicity, and you get rid of a whole bunch of lines of code, right? Because uh, there's a user land missing and a hypervisor missing, and a second instance of the host kernel is also missing, so I think it's worth it. Um, now, the execution. The execution of me as a Java developer for some couple of years now, Java minus Jar, and then Docker run, I don't even need this RE, I guess. Uh, I want to put a minus RM, a minus minus RM, but it looks very similar for me. It's an, I execute something. And uh, with Docker, I can just do that. And with a compose syntax, which is this YAML specification, it still looks something similar to just the command line. So I think it, it, it's actually good looking. Um, yeah, so for the development setup, our first attempt, how do I, as a developer, work with distributed pipes and uh, their applications? So everything needs to run on my one Docker daemon I have on my laptop. And then here's this console. Um, yeah, how to, how to tell Kafka about Zookeeper and how to tell the streaming application about my Kafka, Zookeeper, and Elasticsearch without having a domain name, really, or an IP address. Of course, I can configure the network so that it binds to my host, but then what happens if I add more Docker engines to it? Mm. Okay, console to the rescue, there's a key value store, you start up, you register yourself, everybody else asks yourself, you put in templates in your container, then use console's template language to render your configuration, and there you have it. And you block as long as console is not up, so you will start console first, then you will start Zookeeper, then you will start the brokers, then they com come up as a cluster, and you go and add Elasticsearch. When you have more Elasticsearch nodes, they will join their cluster, and then afterwards you spawn up your uh, individual applications. Yeah, of course you need to set this Docker host thingy. Um, nothing unusual, I guess Compose syntax is uh, quite clear. You want to expose some ports with uh, Compose 2, and I guess it's still working with Compose 3 specification. You can actually extend a base thing. So in that base YAML, there's a network configuration. 
it's not shown here. Um, yeah, and you load up your systems. Uh, yeah, and that's actually nice. You load up your system, but still, it's only processes, right? You don't, there's not a Linux running, it's just the process, and your host is providing the uh, kernel. Um, okay, so that looks like that. It was looking on my laptop. Then you at the applications uh, we had a couple of minutes ago. Um, very simple, you have a base image with Java, and then you add your jar, and then you say entry point. When Christian was sitting here, he would say basically, Hagen, that's stupid, don't do that in the entry point. Don't do that, bad practice. Um, so everybody, I have said that, that's bad practice. I like it because I still see what I'm doing, and there's no hidden in it SH script in my container mounted somewhere that it does its magic or I inherit and then I don't know what to do or I need to re-log into that container and fix it and see what's my shell script doing. For me this is simpler. And then uh, to just get the container out there we just, okay, I have my IDE, I have my build it my jar and then I tag my container, I log into Docker and then I publish my container. We all do this without signing, of course, and we don't have our own registry. It's all fine, it's all secure. Don't worry, it's here. Um, so the complete tool chain now looks like this. And uh, if you get rid of this and just use the command, we are still at the command line interface somewhat. We just need to now say images, host name, container name. I just do this, actually I think you can get rid of it if you want to. But I think it, it kind of works because I chained together my processes and uh, because I did my programs in that way that I can have the input topic and the output topic. So I, I wouldn't model the pipe in here in between these specifications, right? I have to still do string arcs to say where you are coming from, what you are reading at and where you are writing to. Um, but then in a data center setup, we want to now have more Docker engines and uh, want to distribute the containers across more Docker engines. And now uh, we figured out we can, something, we can do something else. With Compose 3, we can um, basically launch services in Docker. And uh, maybe we don't need uh, console anymore. Um, because we can now use some, something inside the Swarm engine that gives us the server name or the service names and the task ID to identify a certain service. And that's what we do in the version 3 compose file. Um, yeah, so you join, you build a network, you then be on the network, and then for deploy Docker services, you can actually say how many replicas do you want and what's the resource constraints for any given service. Um, here's another thing where you can have the update config where it says when I do a rolling upgrade of your service, what would be the intermediate delay and what's the parallelism? So how many shutdowns I do at one po given time? Imagine this uh, line feed fake producer would be there 10 times and I said do a rolling upgrade and it would go one by one by one, or it can go, I shut everything down and then start everything new again. You have control over that with Compose 3. Depends on, and then you have a restart policy. Do you want to try once and then fail forever? Do you want to always, when you die, get restarted again? You have control over that. I think it's very nice. And then in a data center, it would look something like, oh, sorry. Uh, create your network. Uh, Deploy the stack, and I've split it, my stack into the backends, the distributed pipe, the Kafka thingy, and the stream processors in the front end. So you can uh, have both uh, running, and because in their specification they share the same attachable uh, network, they all see each other and they work together. Okay, having the recap, um, it's basically uh, a pipe and a function can be expressed as a message broker and a stream processor and you can put them all into Docker and then be happy. Now, there are some things uh, that, <laughs> that I think are 
uh, for tooling it's good enough, but I would never try this actually in production, I guess, and I'm fine with my SREs holding off and saying, Hagen, don't do that. Um, so, yeah, the counting. How do you count something when you see something? You don't know how often you see something. That's how do you count? What's 10 now? Is, is 10 11? Is 10 20? Is 10 100? Something has gone wrong, your broker would be just restarting, you upgrade the codec, you do a rolling upgrade, and boom, 10,000 messages are duplicated. Is that now 10,000 or one? Um, I estimated 10,000 with my heavy hitter here. Um, but exactly once it's coming, there are some transaction API for Kafka. I, I saw one talk about it. Um, didn't fully grasp, but I guess it's coming. And that's obviously something that Flink provides you. And uh, yeah, for doing some exact calculations, you, <laughs> you need exactly once. And it's not like, it shouldn't be like that. Um, so going from a laptop to a data center, you still need capacity planning. There's no way that you go, I just like, how do you partition your data? How many processes can do what? Where are you blocking? Where are you waiting on what? You all still need to do that. It's not like you, like if it's a difference if you try to process 10 terabytes or 10 gigabytes of data. And uh, how many brokers do you want to apply? And how much stream processes do you need? And which stage is very costly and whatnot? And uh, that's still not trivial. And there's still nothing I can see uh, that, that helps you with that or do it automatically. And uh, testing and debugging. Of course, it runs on Docker. You can have integrations tests. You can have your colleague and you build a Docker swarm, and then you can go a bit bigger, and then you can fake the data, and then you can look at it even, and, and blah, blah, blah. But in production, what about this consistency in the state storage? So it has a state storage, and it's a Vault DB, I guess, by default. It's a key value store, and then it gets synced over the network, and the changes will be applied to all other instances. But eh, it's still cap that kicks in, and it's still kind of like, how do I know in a production scenario that everything is correct? That's not trivial to debug, and if you have now a nice API, but doing that is still necessary. Um, processing time versus event time. Are you sure that what you are counting here is happening in the same time interval, or are you looking at something that the event came yesterday or was created yesterday, but I'm now counting it in that window of now? Does that make sense? So you need to be aware of where do I put in my processing time, when, when do I timestamp, like this is now and this is for me now and then the event is <laughs> yesterday or today, like that's, there are some tricky thingies that can go with, wrong with your stream processing. Um, and what about Amdahl's law? So yeah, sure, I can build a hundred topics in Kafka that would happily do that and I couldn't also process into a hundred topic and it will happily do that, but now I'm doing this aggregate by key. What's now? Like, is this a single point of aggregation and everybody waits and holds off until my one job gets together and basically has everything? Or do we build these graphs where you go and, okay, that's the first map step, then you reduce, then you reduce further, then you reduce further. Are you need to rebuild this now with Kafka streams? Or can you, does it just magically work? So I think at a certain size, Amdahl's law will get you because there will be threads waiting to get, get the aggregation or the final step done. Um, and then Docker volumes. Um, so you have a bare metal host and then you say, yeah, that's my root server big data directory and uh, everything, every container you build mounts into that and puts in the application name and then you write to that disk and if the container dies, eventually he will be back up again and hooked to that same volume and everything is good. Um, but for Elasticsearch, does that work? Does that actually, will it pick up and then the indexes and, and then will Elasticsearch happily do the reallocation of the shards again? because it has now a different node ID running on the same volumes with the same, I guess not. And then Kafka also, can you like, no. So Docker volumes and like containerizing these, these data systems still has some issues and it's, uh, 
there were one idea came, I don't know if it was in December or January, where somebody said, basically all our volumes now live in Ceph. So Ceph is a, also a distributed uh, file system a bit quicker than uh, HDFS, and then they, they would put their volumes in there, and they could pinpoint their volumes to Docker container IDs, and then when a container dies, he will come up at a different node, and then will know, ah, my volume is at Zef, and Zef goes, oh, I'm actually in your rack. Here you have your volume. And uh, that seems to be a promising idea. Uh, so uh, I was a bit, so I think my, my little uh, example did work for me. Uh, I can do that, and I will do that uh, for not production stuff, but if I need some big data processing, cleaning up some data, I will actually write a small stream processor and, and, and use my Docker stack here and then work with that in that way. But um, more importantly, I think uh, what it also shows is uh, you just need something. And you, not often you need really Hadoop. I mean, most companies have it, but are you really needing it for what you're trying to solve here? Or are you just using it because it's already there? So yes, I'm not against Hadoop at all. Maybe it comes around uh, wrongly, but it's just that in order to have a simple system, there are a lot of lines of code in the Hadoop stack, and it's not exactly a fresh technology by now anymore. So maybe you don't need it. Maybe you can can do something with it uh, without it. And then Albert Einstein also thinks <laughs> that you need to do the stuff needs to be simple, but not too simple. Um, I just let that sink. And then what, what they told me at my university uh, was this guy, William Ockham. The few is assum assumption, right? We tend to do everything based on a lot of assumptions and uh, clean that out, get rid of it. Like you, really, if you look at something, if you want to have that file here, it's just you're moving that file. There's no need to spin up, uh, what's that called? It's called ACA cluster, I heard. You can shift files around from one disk to another. Or Spring Boot, you can use Spring to copy a file around. Yeah, you can do that, but you shouldn't. And uh, wherever you think of like, ah, oh, that's complicated, maybe your feeling is exactly right at that point, and yeah, don't do it then. Like, we have enough lines of code, and they're bothering all our days. It's like, it's not worth it. Just, if you don't, like, also, but now I'm getting off the rails a bit. If you have a five-week working week, like five days of work, spend the Friday not committing a line of code. That would be your Friday goal, not adding code. There's too much of it. So uh, we have five minutes left, but uh, I guess it's, uh, I'm done. Thanks for listening. Any questions? Uh, yeah, so we have, if, if you have some questions, we have exactly five minutes. So there is some time. First one. Thank you for the talk. Uh, first question is, have you considered using actually Unix pipes? Uh, when, when running lots of containers good, locally, good. and maybe you don't need containers because you have servers with tens of processors and you can do lots of parallel things yeah. just in one single server. Just exactly. questioning. Yeah, no. <laughs> I get teached by my uh, uh, SREs engineers all the time how to do not that. Just do it on a host. We have pretty big hosts and yeah, it would work. The problem is we already put everything in Hadoop and Kafka. So I, <laughs> I would need something bash Kafka tail. Maybe a Golang would Golang program would solve it. No, absolutely right. Of course, for, for some of this stuff, you don't even need this. But like in some organizations, we have this data pipeline already. Yeah? And uh, you just hook into it, and you can maybe gain some simplicity by using Kafka streams. OK. okay. Thank, Thank you. you very much. Uh, Thank you again.